may have heard moderator Patrick Herb tell you that Director of Officials Bill Carollo is next to speak Questions? to the media. Great. Let's head back you. to McCormick Place and listen in to Mr. You know, Carollo. It's always a pleasure for me to address the media, media days here at, uh, in Chicago. Um, it's also an honor to lead the Big Ten officiating, uh, uh, officiating staff. Uh, and I'm entering my ninth year as doing that, and things continue to change. If you heard and listened to the commissioner and all of our coaches actually talk about the changes that we've, ha we've seen uh, as far as football and the landscape in college football, um, it is not just for the players or the coaches or the conference office, but it's for our officials too to adapt and change uh, with these uh, continual changes uh, to our game. If you think about what we've done in the last 10 years, um, as far as rule changes. Uh, most of it's been around player safety. That's still our number one priority, players' health and safety. We, when we start talking about low blocks, cut blocks, peel back blocks, uh, low hits to the quarterback, you know, th we've expanded the defenseless players, that category, um, and of course targeting. And targeting uh, started back in 2008 and it has evolved and it usually grabs the headlines with regard to uh, player safety. Uh, but certainly there's a lot of other changes that we've seen to the game and we don't, when we don't get th some of those calls like targeting correct, we've added technology. We've added replay to, to uh, our targeting. So as of last year, we allowed replay to create a targeting foul. And if for some reason, if we do miss it on the field and it bypasses our replay booth, we've put in certified athletic trainers up in the booth to monitor players' health and safety. So we're doing a lot of things along that line. Um, but we've done some other things as far as technology. We've added the, the eighth official on the field with headsets, communications between the officials. We've put in sign line monitors you know, for replay, so the collaboration between the referee on the field and the replay booth has improved. So we're trying to make the game better. Our goal is to continue to improve. Uh, we're only as good as our last call, and last season was a solid season for us, but we know it wasn't perfect. So we'll continue to c keep working on that, and we've been doing that for the last six months with camps and clinics, spring football. Uh, we're just about to enter into the August camps, and that will be the, f the, the finishing touches before we kick off the season. Uh, so I feel very confident where we're at with regard to our officials uh, and our staff. As I said, our officials and our staff continues to change also. We've had several that go to the NFL. Uh, we've had s some that have retired recently. And, and then because of, uh, we talk about accountability, because of the performance, some officials aren't backed each year you know, aren't invited back. So, um, but I'm really pleased and confident that we're ready to uh, kick off the season and we're ready to go uh, come September 1st. A um, Couple of the new rule changes, when you start to uh, look at, this is an off season, there's a process uh, rule changes. It's not the Big Ten Conference deciding what the rules is, it's a national program with the rules uh, committee as well as the competition committee, uh, the oversight committee, and they all collaborate together to uh, come together and look at the new rules. As far as this process is concerned, we're really focused on four major areas on a national emphasis for points of emphasis. Targeting, of course, and I'll be talk a little bit more detail on that with some of the questions that have come up in, uh, in the last day. Um, but also the sideline management. We put a rule in a couple years ago, the white area are, is the officials area. The coaching box is the, for the coaches, and then there's a player's team box. And we wanted to keep that white area free during live balls, and we've done a nice job uh, doing that. But we're gonna expand that a little bit, and we aren't changing the rule, but a big point of emphasis this year is if you're going to come out in the field as a coach or as a player or any team personnel, come out and challenge a call, complain about a call, you'll get a 15-yard penalty immediately if you come out on the field to challenge the call. So you can certainly come out during timeouts, attend your players, injured players, et cetera, do some coaching, but that's a separate rule from the area of the white on the sideline control. So it's a new point of emphasis. Usually we were um, pretty lenient in this area, and we're going to tighten that up a little bit. We don't have a problem in the Big Ten as far as our coaches uh, and their demeanor, but across the country, it's a national point of emphasis. So that's a, a major area that we're going to take a look at. The other area is pace, pace of play. We're trying, we've won in 2010, to, to uh, this current last season, uh, we've gone from three hours and 10 minutes 
to three hours and 24 minutes for the average game in college football. Now the Big Ten's a little less than that, three hours and 21 minutes, but across the country you'll see more efficiency by the officials on the field and halftime is only going to be the maximum 20 minutes. It'll be Halftime is going to be halftime, 20 minutes. We're going to start the clock after we clear the field and then wind it immediately. And then we expect the players to go right at the 20 minute when it comes down to zero. So that will be a, another area as, far, as well as, you know, being uh, with substitution, substitutions, we're going to be a little bit more efficient getting the ball in play. We don't want to take a plays away from the teams, but we're the dead ball times. We're going to get the clock moving as quickly as possible. Um, unsportsmanlike conduct is also another area that always, along with player safety, is an area that we have a keen eye on throughout the seasons, uh, in the, at least in the past uh, five or six seasons. A uh, couple of new rule changes. We've expanded um, um, the leaping and hurdling rule. We've tightened that up a little bit. You can't come from the second level, the linebacker position, on extra points and field goals. You can't take a running start, jump, leap, and try to block the kick. Okay, 15 yard penalty for leaping or hurdling. Uh, we've expanded that. Uh, before, you, if you took off at the line of scrimmage, it was legal, but you couldn't land on somebody. And now this year, you just can't take a running start. Whether you land on anybody or not, it's going to be a foul. And then we've also expanded um, the horse collar tackle. So we've, not, the rule previously had to do with getting the hand inside the collar inside the shoulder pads and have, having a jerking motion down and buckling the legs. Now we've expanded to the nameplate area. So it doesn't have to be on the inside of the collar, just above the numbers in the nameplate area. That would be a targeting call, excuse me, that would be a horse collar that uh, we will call this year. So we've expanded that. So with that, let me just uh, uh, pause and open up for some questions. And I know we had a couple questions the last few days on the targeting side. And the targeting numbers are up um, as far as I think we've done a good job, but the numbers are up um, across the country as far as there's a trend going upward. And I think we've done a really nice job. The coaches have done an outstanding job. They, they deserve the credit. Uh, but we're calling more targeting calls. We're overturning more in replay. But the net is we're up a little bit. So we've taken away the big hits, uh, the real dangerous plays. But this still, with the numbers going up, we, we can't relax and think that we've got this problem solved uh, because we're very concerned about the targeting issues. So with that, we can open up for some questions. We can start on the left, uh, towards the back. Chad Leist, Dakota, Des Moines Register. Uh, Kirk Ferentz, who knows a thing or two about the offensive line, was, has been openly critical of the low blocking uh, interpretation. He said four weeks, four different interpretations. And last month when I talked to him, he still didn't seem satisfied with how it's been dealt with. What can you say about um, how you've uh, ascertained your officials, how to enforce that consistently throughout the season? Yeah, it's, it, it's a rule that if you take a look at when I talked about changes, the first one I mentioned is low blocks. We've probably had five or six changes in the last 10 years on how or what to call for low blocks. So it's a really good question. I've been working with the, the Iowa coaching staff for the last couple of years on this. Now, unfortunately, this year is a player safety area, even though sometimes low blocks, like hits on quarterbacks, you know, would fall into the player safety. It's been put off to next year. But what we did, uh, and really led by uh, Coach Ferentz, was we've surveyed all the head coaches in FBS and ask them their interpretation, what they'd like to see with regard to low blocks. Because it is a dangerous area. You know, cut blocks are dangerous. And, um, and we're starting to get the results back. They aren't all in, but we'll assemble those results, take it to the rules committee, take it to the coordinators, and put together a mechanics manual, a philosophy uh, manual, as well as changing the rules. If, if need be, we'll change that rule. But it's been under the microscope the last few years, and it was really led by a couple letters that Kurt Ferentz has written to myself, as well as the NCAA, Rogers Redding, um, and uh, the, uh, the Rules Committee. We'll go in the middle here. Andy Coppins, Talking 10. You mentioned the, the pace of play and the length of game, uh, along with some of the changes to replay. How do you see replay fitting into helping with pace of play? 
Well, you, you notice that we I talked about technology when we put uh, headsets. We've expanded the headsets, not just to the eight officials on the field and the alternate that we have in the Big Ten. We're also putting a headset on with the uh, replay person upstairs. So if they can uh, conf make a quick confirmation, on, let's say on a touchdown, instead of actually waiting, going through the whole process, calling down to the sideline attendant, they can just get on, on the headset and tell the referee, you know, touchdown is confirmed. Uh, areas of that uh, nature, maybe the, the down box didn't flip, maybe the clock didn't start. Um, so th that type of um, administrative communication will be helpful. They aren't making the calls, but anything administratively, we do allow replay now to uh, communicate. And one thing I didn't mention is there are some conferences that are experimenting with collaboration with the, with the command center, you know, several miles away from the stadium. And, and that collaboration, similar to what we, do, we're, we are doing in the Big Ten with monitors on the sideline, but the headsets are a, big, a, a good vehicle for the officials, but also it's a tremendous vehicle for the coaches. The coach wants to get some information. What did he do on the pass interference? Was it a cutoff? Was it an arm bar, et cetera? Who did it? What happened? I want to talk to the guy. And we can give him that answer real quick. So that technology has been helping us. Again, right down the middle. Hi, Bill. Scott Dockerman, Land of 10. My question is, is goes back to, to targeting. And in some cases, it seems to be like an all-encompassing call that doesn't really d differentiate between intent and actual head-to-head -head uh, contact. Uh, do you anticipate ever trying to splice that between intentional helmet-to-helmet -helmet or accidental helmet-to-helmet -helmet that just results in a helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit? Yeah, really good question. Um, first of all, the intent um, that word is really not part of most of our definitions when we say pass interference. Well, he didn't intend to pass interfere, but uh, whether it's targeting or holding, he didn't mean to hold him, but he happened to grab the guy. Um, so that isn't in there, but what we're trying to do is we put, first we said you make contact above the head, uh, in the head and neck area, above the shoulders. Um, then we put in forcible contact. So that, that kind of got closer to the intent. Yes, there was con the helmets kissed, right? They came together, but there wasn't forcible contact. So we're trying to expand um, re, uh, the, the replay role as well as the targeting definitions for the officials, what to look for on the field. So we look for sh um, good indicators and bad indicators, high-risk indicators. You know, if he comes in with his helmet down, leads with his crown, comes in with force, if he can't see his target, if he doesn't wrap up, he doesn't keep his head up. He doesn't move his head to the side. There are a lot of things that we're trying to do that we aren't saying he didn't mean to do it. It, it wasn't intentional, but we're looking for indicators and good and bad indicators that will help us get there. Now, because it happens so fast, it's a very difficult call for our officials. Uh, so we advocated let's get replay involved. And replay in slow motion, high definition, has a really good advantage point to take that really difficult play slow it down and see what happened on that play. So we overturned, we called 22 in the Big Ten last year. Four of them were overturned. They were, were not targeting, but I'm telling our officials, when it's close like that, and it has to do with players, health and safety, we want the flag thrown, I want a discussion, collaboration among the officials, and if you're still not sure, we'll send it up to the replay booth. That's the proper mechanics. We're gonna err on the side of safety when it comes to this. So, um, so there's a lot of things that go into that, and if we do miss it, and even last year, three of them of the 22, it just stood, which means whatever we called, we're going to stay with that call. You know, so it, maybe you can net it down to about 15 calls. It's a very difficult call. We use technology to help us, and when we do miss it, we've got that certified athletic trainer upstairs. We've got replay looking at it, and they can create that foul. But it's... Um, you know, it's, it's a tough area, it's a, but I'm not making any excuses. They pay us to make those calls and we'll make them and we're training on it. And we spend at least 50% of our time in training trying to understand that because if I miss a pass interference, you know, I'm not real happy. Um, if we miss a targeting call, I am really, really disappointed because we've got different areas of the game on the field, eight officials, that's why we went to eighth, the eighth official. Now we put it in the hands of replay. Now we put it in the hands of a, a spotter upstairs to help us. We do not ever want to miss a targeting call. Now we did have one call last year that we, we made the call, but it didn't rise to the, it had all the indicators, but it wasn't over and above either a block 
a tackle. In this case, the player was making a play on the ball. And we made a mistake on that play. But I hate to miss it and, and make a mistake and let a, a hit like that go through and not flag it. Over here on the right. Hey, Bill. Gavin Go with Daily Line Eye. Um, Pat Fitzgerald said earlier that he wants um, repeat offenders and teams that have been getting targeting calls repeatedly to be looked at. Is that something you guys are considering? Yeah, we've had discussions on that, uh, repeat offenders. I mean, obviously, if you do it one time, you're out, right, uh, from that standpoint. And there was a lot of discussion with the Rules Committee. If we can't confirm it, to the example I was talking about, we had three plays that, were, that stood. You know, there was a lot of talk, let's change the rule. Let's just make it a 15-yard penalty and let them stay in the game. That had a lot of momentum for a couple months in the offseason. But I think cooler heads prevailed on this because we wanted to keep it in the game the way it is today. And, um, and I think that um, repeat offenders, teams that, uh, that continue to target players, usually it's a phone call from me, you know, to the head coach, highlighting that situation uh, and giving them some reminders. And if he wanted us to bring some, some officials in to, to kind of talk through that. But we, we have a, a targeting film that we take to all the teams, you show it to them and, and explain, well, here's the difference, here's why this is a targeting, here's why this is not targeting. Um, but I think that the Rules Committee is looking at it, they're talking about it, uh, but certainly we don't have a big problem in the Big Ten with regard to the number of targeting calls compared to any other of the major five conferences or all FBS. You know, we're below the average, but it doesn't mean that, you know, one isn't too many, you know, when we have it. Are there any other further questions at this time? If not, thank you. Okay.